Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to the, to the book festival. My name is Elif Shafak, and this is part of a series of conversations that uh, I have the pleasure uh, and the privilege of guest curating. And I'm very excited uh, right now to be in share to share this stage with Siri Husveth, a woman whose both fiction and nonfiction I so admire. Um, a woman who has a very multidisciplinary background, multidisciplinary interests, and who shares these uh, interests, who shares these ideas with us. Coming from Turkey, I'm very used to using the word public intellectual in a much more positive context. I mean, I'm not saying that in Turkey people usually like public intellectuals, <laughs> we like to <laughs> hate them, but <laughs> there's some kind of respect also for the, for the role of the public intellectual. Uh, maybe it's similar to Russia in that regard. And the novelist is expected to have opinions about politics, about what's happening in the world. As I travel throughout Europe, continental Europe in particular, when I look at France, Poland, Hungary, similar traditions, but then when I look at the case in the UK, it's not like that at all. And oftentimes the word public intellectual in this country is used as a negative word. I know I've heard it, this from many friends, from colleagues, writers, who think if I call myself a public intellectual, uh, people think I, I'm very arrogant. People think I'm snobbish, elitist. Uh, so the, the way the term is used is, to me, it's very problematic because I think we do need public intellectuals. Uh, and I, as a public intellectual, I want to ask to you, is that your experience in, in America or did you experience a similar thing uh, in well, this country? Yes, just before that, I would like to say this is a mutual admiration society. <laughs> Um, and I very e much admire this woman as a public intellectual. <laughs> uh, so actually, I gave a radio uh, interview uh, for one of the BBC programs. This was uh, quite, a f it was a few years ago. And uh, during the conversation, it was with a woman, uh, she asked me about my a uh, strange trajectory into multiple fields. And I said, well, you know, I am an intellectual. And I've been an intellectual for a very long time. And she looked at me in a, with, a, you know, she was shocked. <laughs> and she said, no one says that in England. <laughs> and, um, and then I didn't say this because I didn't think of it at the time, but I thought of it later, as we always do, l'esprit d'escalier, you know, you go home, you're on the steps, and you say, why didn't I say that? Well, now I can say it, which is that no one says that about an athlete yeah. um, of either sex. No one says, uh, you know, if an athlete says, well, you know, I was had a really good game, and... <laughs> and, and, you know, one of the great athletes. So then we have to ask ourselves what that's about. I think both in American and in British culture, there's a, a heavy strain of anti-intellectualism. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the United States now, well, and actually the UK now, uh, anti-elitism has its ugly side. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, the idea of... Um, you know, it's just the people, and in the in the United States under Trump, this has become just the white people. Yeah, of course, absolutely. Uh, uh, so I think we have to be careful about that. And when I think of being an intellectual, what does that mean to me? It means that I love ideas, and I have loved them since I could begin entertaining them. So maybe electophile. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is the correct term. <laughs> <laughs> I am definitely an electophile. And I think that um, if you look at what a public uh, intellectual could possibly be in the best sense of the word, it would be one of many yeah. uh, uh, voices. So you create an intellectual polyphony. Yeah. You know, multiple voices with multiple views that are all... Uh, part of the picture. No one owns the truth. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yes, indeed. And I think that multiplicity is so crucial to understand your work. 
when I read uh, a woman looking at men looking at women, the essays on sex, art, culture, politics, and how they interact, it is precisely that multiplicity that so much resonates with me. And I find it very problematic, the way in which we are being reduced to narrow, singular identities. And this pressure is coming from all sides. I think extremists are saying something similar. They're saying, are you, if you're a Muslim, be just a Muslim according to their definition. Or if you, the populists are saying that, you know, as if you can't be many things at the same time, which is closer to our truth. We are all made of water. We all have multiple <laughs> belongings. You know, yes, it needs yes. to flow. Uh, but I fully agree with what you said. It goes hand in hand with this anti-knowledge, almost, trend. And part of it, I think, is uh, unfortunately we have had one case after another in which the polls failed to predict yes. elections, right? Do you will remember the Arab Spring happened, but how many people had predicted the Arab Spring or the outcome of it? The financial crisis, the Euro crisis, Brexit, then Trump happened. So now there are many people who are saying, you know what, this elite, they get it wrong each time anyhow. The right. polls, they get it wrong anyhow, you know? Why yes. do you need them? You are the real people. You don't need knowledge. You don't need to listen to them. You just trust your gut instinct. I've heard, I've read these statements from very, you know, populist demagogues all across Turkey, Europe, Hungary. Uh, there's this myth that there's a real people yes. untouched. I find that very dangerous because the hatred of knowledge goes hand in hand with the romanticization of the, of the people. Of yes, the and I, I mean, we remember yeah. not that they're identical. I think that there are significant differences, but this was, of course, uh, ran very deep in the fascist movement. Sure. In, uh, in Europe in the 1930s. Sure. And there's a Dutch scholar um, named, he has a strange name, Mas Mudde, I don't I could be Mas, M-U-D-D-E. Mm -hmm. He has spent his scholarly life studying right-wing populism. Mm -hmm. And I think he had an article, it might have been in The Guardian, and he said, uh, one of the, uh, the response of the press to a right-wing, uh, populist victory is always to say, oh, those poor people, they've been neglected, the elites don't understand them. And this comment was followed by uh, the man saying, we have to understand that angry white men are not the people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, this happened very much after Trump's victory, that suddenly uh, uh, the Rust Belt white guy and the white women who sympathized with them were the mm -hmm. sort of momentary designation of the people. Mm -hmm. Now, I marched in the Women's March yeah. the day after, mm -hmm. uh, in Washington, the day after the inauguration, and... Uh, and I didn't hear anyone talking about the 800,000 people marching on Washington as the people. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Masses of people. We were not the people. The press does not regard us yeah. as the people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's something that's to remember. <laughs> that, is so, that is so true. Absolutely. I mean, we had uh, similar cases in this country as well after the Brexit vote. Yes. The first things that Nigel Farage said was the real people, the decent people in the UK have made their choice and they have spoken up. Uh, I respect <laughs> the, that vote, but it sounds as if there's also an unreal people, you know, somewhere. Exactly. And they're not that real. That's right. They're so not, the, yeah, the, the yeah. real, the dangerous word. Yeah. Real is real. I know. Right. So yeah. so that's what we have to be careful of. Yeah. And in this sense, I remain a neo-Kantian, which means that as Kant said, you could never get to the thing in itself, das Ding an sich. We are all limited mm -hmm. by the being human beings, mm -hmm. by our uh, mental apparatus. Mm -hmm. It's it's not all seeing. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, Bayesian statistical methods are very good, but they're not perfect. Not at all. No. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but that doesn't mean that we have to throw statistics out the window.
oh, right? Absolutely. Right. <laughs> exactly. No. We need statistics, we need the facts, but we also need emotional intelligence. Yes. Because the emotions do guide politics so much. Anxiety, anger, fear of the other, fear of the future. And I think, I don't know if you'd agree, maybe we need to do a better job from now on. Because I think, unfortunately, populist demagogues connect better with people's emotions. Uh, at that level, and, and we, should, we should create spaces. I find it very important. I might be critical of populist politicians, but people who voted for them, I want to hear what they think, what those anxieties are. And I personally think it's perfectly okay to have fears. What happened yesterday in Barcelona, the traumas that we're all experiencing, in fact, uh, all of this is okay to, to fear, the, to, to have worries about immigration, about refugees. We, we, we can talk about these things. But what is not okay is to be guided by fear. Yes. Yeah? And then we make the worst mistakes. And, and I think there, the f fear is really important, but the most shaping emotion in all of this is shame. Yeah. And shame is then in relation to not particular human beings that are regarded as, as, as elites, but the very idea of an elite, right? Because the idea of an elite means that somebody's looking down on you. Sure. And I think those white people out on the plains, I grew up in Minnesota, believe me, that these are not foreigners to me, um, that that has been a long run, running prejudice on the right and the left, and it's this. Those fancy city people, mm -hmm. those bankers, mm -hmm. you know, those people with all the money, they're looking down at us. Mm -hmm. Banker, by the way, in the olden days, that was code for Jew. So these prejudices run deep, and they go in the yeah. Midwest from you know, pretty far left to pretty far right. Now mm -hmm. it's mostly the right wing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, but um, mm -hmm. I, um, I lived in America uh, right after 9-11. It was a very weird time to, to, to be in the States, also because I was in Boston, Michigan, and then Arizona, Tucson. And it was so interesting to see these contrasts, very progressive, almost bubbles, liberal campuses, right, where right. women's movement, LGBT movement is very strong. But the moment you leave that space, as you said, it's a completely different world. And of course, correct me if I'm wrong, now that gap is even, even sharper. How are we going to be able, how sh can we talk to people who are not necessarily in this room? Yeah, how do we find the narrative, the language to go beyond these echo chambers that we've been divided into? And I'm also curious uh, to get your opinions on this. Do you think writers have a, a bigger responsibility today? Because of all that's happening, do you think we need to become more vocal, more active and speak up? And sometimes I think as if you're a writer from Turkey, from Nigeria, from Pakistan, all these wobbly or wounded democracies, I honestly think you don't have the luxury of being apolitical. But perhaps yes, this yes. is the time when I it's think the case for all of us. If you yes, if you live in the United States and uh, you are living in the aftermath of what looks like a pretty horrific uh, decision, at least by the Electoral College, yeah. I think we it we <laughs> we have to do what we can as writers. And for me, that's meant writing. Um, during the campaign, I wrote a screed against yeah. Trump that was published in an uh, uh, online magazine called Slate. It felt very good to get, <laughs> to get it out. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, and, uh, and, and I've done more of that, even some more scholarly position yeah. papers on, on what's, what's happening, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, I wrote a paper called Not Just Globalization, yeah. The Emotional Demons of White Populism. So I think emotion is, is key. Mm -hmm. And we're all driven by emotion in politics. Yeah. So the alarm about fake news, which I think is important, it's not that people find fake news and believe it. It's that fake news is answering what they want to believe. Mm -hmm. And that's 
an important distinction to be made that's rarely made in the press. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That material, whatever it is, that Hillary Clinton is running a, 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 what, a, a pornographic, a child pornography ring from a pizza parlor in Washington, <laughs> D.C., which sounds like absolute nutland. Sure was believed by hundreds of thousands, if not more, people. And then there was, it was a poor, wounded white man who rushes, rushes into the pizza parlor with his gun yeah. to save the children. Yeah. Yeah. Now, <laughs> yeah. you, you know, what, what do we do with that? Well, I think if we don't understand human, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how we work as human beings, mm -hmm and that we are driven by emotion, that, that our guiding uh, uh, force mm -hmm. is not, in fact, ration, yeah. but uh, even the most highly uh, uh, you know, refined and developed um, scholars are also driven by passion. Sure. And if anyone has ever read a dry academic te text, I've read many of them, um, you know, they're really boring unless there's some push there, some emotional oomph that's pushing it forward. Do, do you think, although it's, uh, I mean, I know you've been very vocal, critical, uh, openly, both of Trump, but also populism in general and, and tribalism, um, but do you think it's it's a difficult marriage between politics and literature? Is there this danger of it affecting our writing, um, which because the language of literature is much more nuanced, yes. much more, it's a different language. Do you feel that conflict, that tension between? Yes, yeah, I, I, I yeah. do, because um, I, I think in, in, in uh, and this is very interesting because I, not very long ago, I read your most recent novel, mm -hmm. and it's definitely what I would call a political novel. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, uh, what fascinates me about the book is that it re it remains a novel. It's not a political tract, yeah. right? And uh, the politics then are embodied, if you will, yeah. in a um, uh, number of characters mm -hmm. who, you know, have complex lives. Mm -hmm. They're not just political beings. None of us is a purely political being, political. except possibly Lenin, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, I don't, he, what, you know, yeah, yeah, not such a nice guy. Not uh, such. Yeah. A <laughs> I don't even know. If, I mean, he I, p apparently just wasn't interested in sex, for example. Mm -hmm. This. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's pretty boring. But I think, <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and and maybe this is something I, I personally have learned better from from feminism or feminisms from women's movement. Yeah. One of the many wonderful things that feminism taught us was to say politics is not only about political parties, it's not only about parliament, it's also in our daily lives. Yes. Wherever there's power, the personal is also political. So if we can define politics in a much more broader way, more diffused, then I think asking questions in itself is a political act, especially asking difficult questions about yes. difficult issues, particularly taboos. So yeah. this could be political taboos, but also sexual taboos, cultural taboos, just to say, why is it like that? Yes. Um, there's different ways of doing politics, yeah. Yes, and I think that, I'm, I mean, you were asking, how do we create bridges, say, yeah. among, you know, uh, uh, is, where is the avenue for dialogue? Yeah. Uh, you know, with the man who rushed into the pizza parlor. Yeah. Well, he might, you know, yeah. be able to have a dialogue with a psychiatrist, that might be the first stop, right? But there were other people who participated in this who were not mad people. Mm -hmm. And uh, and obviously hammering someone over the head with a uh, political slogan mm -hmm. is not going to work. It's not going to work. <laughs> oh, would you, would you agree work. with me? I 
during this uh, campaign in, in America, presidential campaign, I was sad when I heard Hillary Clinton's statement saying half of Trump's voters were basket were deplorables. of deplorables. <laughs> I really <laughs> thought that they, she could lose the election. Um, I think it's one thing to criticize these demagogues, and we must openly right. so. But another thing to say, you know, everyone who votes for them is this way or that way or is a xenophobe or an Islamophobe. It was a, a huge Islamophobe. mistake. I right? thought it was such it, a it bad mistake. It was a mistake. huge mistake. Yeah. At the same time, there, you know, it, it's one thing to be able to sympathize, for example, with a benevolent sexist or someone, you know, most people have implicit sexist and racist sure. views. And, uh, and that ex extends even to um, ideas about the self, right? I mean, uh, in America, um, you know, the, the problem of, say, uh, Jews being anti-Semitic, having anti-Semitic beliefs and, you know, implicit, it's not that you're completely conscious of this. Mm -hmm. The same with uh, w with women mm -hmm. feeling uh, their self demeaning yeah. essentially. So, and those beliefs are, and that has to do with perception, right? How do we perceive the world? We perceive the world yeah. through our past perceptions of it. Yeah. So, the past is a predictive. Uh, a vehicle for the future. Mm -hmm. And unless we become conscious of those patterns, they will endlessly repeat themselves. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think perceptions are so, so important in politics as well. I was thinking as I was listening to you, when we look at the elections and how they panned out uh, across Europe, for instance, let's take Poland as an example. When I look at the population in Poland, the majority of it is is white, uh, Catholic. Uh, they don't have, a, let's say, diversity problem or an immigration problem. But one of the biggest issues during the elections in Poland was immigration. Yeah. So it's the perception <laughs> of, you know, not necessarily what's happening, but what might happen, the anxieties that, that we project to each other. I think it's very much affecting uh, the world of politics today. And I'm worried because when I look at countries like Turkey, I think it very much shows us the fragility of democracy. Yes. We don't know how to deal with this. You know, this, what populist movements are doing, when they come to power, they benefit enormously from staying in power. The longer they stay, the more they consolidate that power to suppress all Absolutely. other voices. Yeah. But even when they are in opposition, even when they are a small party, relatively, um, like in Holland, they have an impact beyond their size yes. because they push mainstream politicians to a corner where they have to also use a much more nationalistic, jingoistic tone. Right. You know, Absolutely. otherwise you're not patriotic enough. Right. That's the accusation. Right. right. So how do we deal with this? It's it's a it's a big dilemma, and I'm worried that the, uh, democracy is much more fragile than than we realized perhaps for a long time. You're absolutely right, and I and and I don't think that human beings are you know we're not going to read our way out of it. Mm -hmm. But in my utopia, that's exactly what we would. <laughs> we would just read our way out of it. So, so you know, the the novel. I mean, I, I can think again about your novel. The novel is the the modern novel, but you know, there are Greek novels too. But they were generally organized in a different way. The the novel that was so important here in uh, in England, really the birthplace, if you will, of the modern novel and also in France, um, it, it's about particular people and particular lives. And speaking of elitism, they weren't fancy people, sure. right? It's, it's the ordinary person's life. And I think that that is one way of being in contact with the other, mm -hmm. the other with a capital O. Sure. Right. And, uh, and, I think it's also, of course, often the case that 
anti-immigrant hysteria seems to be located in places without immigrants. Yeah. <laughs> it's true That's in the often states. The case. It's, it's true in the states. I think yeah. it was true in the the Brexit vote. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it's Poland you yeah. just mentioned. Yeah. So uh, the the fear of the other grows with the absence of the other. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That uh, so that actual human contact seems to diffuse uh, that fear. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, New York City is a, a good example. It's not that we're perfect. It's not that uh, there aren't racist uh, incidents mm -hmm. and, and police harassment. There, there certainly are. At the same time, it's a city of a great deal of to tolerance. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, yeah. I want to talk a little bit about the world of literature as well, because at first glance it looks much more different than the world of politics. It looks more nuanced, more liberal, more open-minded. But when you scratch the surface, underneath, I think it can be just as sexist as uh, the rest of the, of the world. Uh, when I look at countries like Turkey, for instance, in, in Turkey, if you are a woman writer, you're primarily a woman. And then people will remember that you're a writer. If you're a male novelist, nobody will talk about your gender. You are a novelist, and that's full stop. And I think it very much affects the way people read our work, too, and review our work. And I know, uh, having read several of your novels, uh, you have experienced similar things because you know the, the the women you write about people automatically assume that it must be <laughs> it you. must be me because yeah i mean i'm often amazed by this there's a kind of reduction and you know i wrote two novels as men and um and i remember i gave an interview to something it was actually a women's site and I said that probably the character that I'm closest to in my whole, all the novels I've written is the narrator of a novel called What I Loved. His name is Leo Hertzberg. And he's, a, a, when he's writing the book, he's a 70-year-old Jewish man. And the headline for this interview was, you know, it was like, ha, ha, ha. Siri identifies, Siri Hustvedt identifies with old Jewish man. <laughs> And I thought, oh, they think this is hilarious. Yeah. And for me, that's what it means to be a writer. Sure. And I was asked over and over, you know, wasn't it hard to write as a man? Mm -hmm. Now, unless I'm mistaken, men are not asked, wasn't it hard to write as a woman? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just assumed that's in their repertoire, I guess. <laughs> um, so there's no, there's a lot of that, and the very idea of autobiography seems to be associated with women mm -hmm. in a negative way. Mm -hmm. With men, for some reason, I mean Karl Uwe Knausko, the Norwegian yeah. writer Knausgard, I think you say, yeah. his, supposedly his whole life, sure. volume after volume after volume. And everybody thinks it's just wonderful. Diaper changing, potato peeling, every detail. And that is a kind of heroic act for a man. <laughs> but for a woman, you know, it never would have been published. I mean, a woman would never have gotten that novel published. <laughs> no one wants to hear about that, taking the kids to the nursery school and stuff. <laughs> So yeah, there's a, there, and also this idea, I think that, you know, women's work is somehow more personal, more autobiographical, and just in general, softer. Yeah. Because we're suspicious of the arts, the arts are already feminine. Since the Romantic movement, at least in the West, the whole idea <laughs> of the arts is kind of decorative, floral, femi. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Absolutely. And by speak, and we go back in history, what did the Greeks do when they wanted to humiliate the Persians? They called them feminine. Of course. Right. So there's, we have a long history in the West of doing this. Yeah. And Absolutely. so if you're a woman and a novelist, yeah. then you're doubly feminized. Yeah. 
So I find when I'm talking to a group of people about neuroscience, that masculinizes me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I'm still a woman, you know, mm -hmm. nothing to be done. At least I don't want to do anything. <laughs> I'm fine. But it, that makes me, um, and, and the audiences reflect that. About 80% men, when I'm talking about philosophy or neuroscience or neurology, and to a literary audience, it's usually exactly flipped. Yeah, and it's almost the same all around the world. Most fiction readers are women, and I think if the novel is alive and kicking, it's we owe a big thank you to, to women readers who also share. But uh, why do we compartmentalize ourselves like that? Even here in Edinburgh, I have observed women can be a bit more reluctant to speak up or ask questions if the subject is politics, finance, economy and somehow feel more comfortable if we're talking about fiction and other issues, as if there's a division of labor in our minds that I believe we need to question. I, over the years, I taught in different universities, both in Turkey and in the States, and I'm generalizing a bit, but it would always struck me to see young people, wherever you go, whether you're in Istanbul or in Michigan, so similar, their dreams, aspirations, uh, frustrations, but in one respect, there was a big difference, and that is speaking in public. Yeah. Big, big, big difference. So if you would give uh, readings to Turkish students, they would come back the next week having read everything, because that's the discipline we have. If the teacher gives you, you know, homework, you do your homework. You know, you ha we have internalized that va those values. But then they would be very much unwilling to talk about the subject. They've read the you know, manuscripts, the books, but they don't want to talk about it. Whereas in America, it would be the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't read it. They would got come back to say. having not read a single <laughs> page, but very willing to talk about the subject. <laughs> How amazing is that? <laughs> yeah. Well, also, I mean, there are different r relations to authority sure, in that sure, case. Sure. But I find, okay, so at academic conferences, the first three questions, always from men. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the women lose. And then up. the women slowly. Then the women lose. Yeah. Up, yeah. yeah. Well, I hope we're going to change that <laughs> when we get the, the questions from. No, from after I our noticed audience. that, yeah. I started asking the first question. Yeah. Just to do it. I mean, just because I thought, I'm not going to let this happen. Mm -hmm. And you know, to ask the first question, you have to be really forceful. You have to go like this. <laughs> And it works. <laughs> it works. <laughs> a, a few more things be, be, before we wrap up. We All talked right. about politics, literature. I want to uh, share this with you, and I don't know if you'd, you, you would agree, but I think for women writers, as maybe, maybe as we get older, does it become easier to write about sexuality in general? Because Yes, it is hard to be a woman, it's harder to be a woman writer, but also maybe it's much harder to be a young woman writer, and especially patriarchal societies like Turkey, very sexist, very homophobic countries, somehow they have this strange respect for the matriarch because yes. of the way we have, you know, we've been raised. But the matriarch is always defeminized, desexualized, yes. right? So yes. we respect her, not as a woman, as a different category altogether. And I think many women across the Middle East, especially women who want to be respected with their thoughts, their brains, they can't wait to get old. We want to age as quickly as possible because when you're younger, it's much, much harder. I, I, I think this is true. I mean, obviously there are, are, are cultural differences sure. and it's played out in different ways. But I have to say, I have a very similar feeling, and I've really welcomed an older face and my wrinkles. Because, you know, give, you get more respect. Yeah. And people, you know, not just men, but people don't condescend to you in the same yeah, way. And, and I use an example in one of the essays um, that I wrote trying to... Uh, make it clear how we all carry these prejudices in us. It's a fictional story, but there are two people uh, at a cocktail party. They look across the room, they see this absolutely beautiful young woman with a low cut dress and a glass of champagne, and she's laughing. And one person says to the other, 
You mean that beautiful girl over there is working on her second postdoctorate in molecular biology at Rockefeller? <laughs> now, I happen to have met some young women like that, sure. and so it, she is not a fantasy, but the culture at large has a very hard time thinking about especially, okay, young, lovely, uh, fertile mm -hmm. women as intellectuals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We do in the West, with the, certainly in the right. East, it's something. Yeah. So that idea that you, what I call it, I call it aging out. <laughs> <laughs> that you age out of that. And one can't help but welcome that a bit. I mean, I, I, I can't help but embrace it. At the same time, it's brutally unfair. Yeah. Right? I feel the same way. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Earlier, we, uh, in, in the morning, we had Nicola Sturgeon. And of course, female politicians, women politicians, clothes oh. is, a, is a massive debate in this country and terrible, everywhere in the terrible. world. But I'm also curious, are we also maybe projecting those values to ourselves? You know, we internalize. Mm -hmm. I look at myself, uh, I, I was mentioning, you know, my children always make fun of my wardrobe. They open it and it's black, 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 gray, <laughs> black, 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 <laughs> maybe brown. <laughs> and it, it makes me sad that I was not able, uh, still I'm not able to embrace all colors. And I spent part of my childhood in Spain. That was the first thing that struck me to see this you know, maybe explosion of colors and how Spanish women could carry those colors. The first time on the public bus in Madrid, I saw this grandmother wearing a very bright red lipstick. The grandmothers that I knew in Ankara, uh, my grandmother included, would never do that, you know, and how right. wonderful that lipstick looked on that old woman's, you know, face. So the colors, the way we dress up, the way we present ourselves, uh, that part worries me because it means we have internalized those patriarchal I think values we ourselves. Ab absolutely, we do. And I have to say, I I'm 62, and the colors are coming out. And I just have <laughs> one little story about a friend of mine who's a physicist. Well, he's a neuroscientist now, but he started as a physicist. We were having lunch in Paris together, and he told me a wonderful story about uh, a, a, a physicist, a woman, you know, physics does not have a lot of women. Sure. But this particular person, uh, he noticed that when she was younger and working really hard, she always wore gray, black, very somber clothes. And then she, um, I think she was, you know, s still young because physicists do their best work young. There's something, we don't know, but there's something about that. She published a really groundbreaking paper. And she got famous f fast. And he said, the high heels, the, the red dresses, it just came out of the closet. <laughs> Suddenly, you know, it was like she had made it. And she could dress exactly the way she wanted. So I thought it was a wonderful story. I think that's a wonderful story. <laughs> <laughs> and so true. She was finally free. Finally free, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Shall we slowly yeah. open this yeah, for, for, for your questions, your comments from the audience? We're looking forward to that. There's someone back there. Oh, there yes, there. and we have women yeah. <laughs> going first. They took the hint. <laughs> they took it. <laughs> um, hello. Uh, I, my question's for Ellie Frilly. And, um, me and my partner have spent the last kind of six years traveling around Turkey a lot. Yeah. Ah. And we spend about four months a year in Turkey. Yeah. And we've met fantastic people. We really like Turkey and its people. Yeah. However, as things progress, we become more anxious about whether we should boycott Turkey or whether we should yeah. continue yeah, see, being see, in see. Turkey. Mm -hmm. And it's something I'd like your opinion on. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I'm so glad you brought yeah, this up. We, we have talked been about that earlier. Yeah, yeah. Siri and I have been talking about this. We both care about these issues a lot. I personally think um, there are some fundamental universal issues that we should never be quiet about. And these are human rights, freedom of speech, freedom of press, women's rights, LGBT rights, minority rights. So it troubles me when 
politicians in Western societies, I either in the name of preserving yeah. the stability or some other trade connections, they prefer to be quiet on these issues. That troubles me. However, I think we should also make a distinction between governments and the people. Yeah. Because yeah. there are so many people who do not think like their governments. In fact, they are far ahead of their governments. And yet we don't hear these people's voices as much as we should. But they exist. They are there. And I think that precisely because of this, it matters a lot that we go to these countries and connect with people. If we isolate countries that have wounded democracies, I'm, I'm worried that we will only be um, strengthening the hand of isolationists. And who are they? Ultranationalists, Islamists, and, and anyone who benefits from authoritarianism. So let's be critical of the politics and politicians, but let's not isolate the people. Let's not boycott the people. Yeah, yeah that's so good. I came back from Turkey, and the week, a week after, I saw in The Guardian a leader of comments by Erdogan. Mm -hmm. And I wrote to The Guardian, I said it was a complete shame to mm. put his, his opinion in a paper like that in Britain. Mm. I was horrified to see that the British press was actually giving him a voice when mm. he has imprisoned so many journalists. Mm. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I understand, of course, in the name of balance yeah. or <laughs> neutrality, yeah. they, they do that. But do we have to? Um, because already their voices are so loud, right? Yeah. It yeah. is the other voices that we don't hear, exactly. and exactly. They, need, they need more exactly. space. Uh, but Siri has, uh, we've been talking about these boycotts. I, I'd love you no, to I share your I think it's really a complicated question. I mean, uh, for um, my husband and I were in Israel in 2010, and it was a literary festival. The first thing the Israeli press asked uh, is, you know, why did you come? Uh, did people pressure you not to come? And uh, I think that, again, it's a distinction between the people and also as writers, if you are, and uh, we both were free to, uh, uh, to, we did interviews where we were politically uh, very, clear very clear about our opinions about yeah. Israeli policy uh, in the territories and how suicidal they are, frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think one does have to make that distinction. Yeah. 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 Shall we? You spoke about politics and literature, and we have another American novelist in the audience whose work has become increasingly political and politicized, I think. So apart from his work, who else do you read? Who do you turn to? You know, who do you read as the American authors who speak about what's happening in America and in the world today? You know, I think the, the novel as a form um, is actually something that's usually, as Wordsworth said, recollected in tranquility. Uh, it is very difficult to write a brilliant work about now, yeah. right? The now. Yeah. You can write papers, you can write some, a response, but at least in my case, novels are sifted through. I know, for example, it is impossible to set a novel uh, during the time of 9-11 in New York and not account for it. Mm. You know, there are certain what we think of as gigantic events. I think it's hard to write, will be hard to write any novels after the Trump election. I mean, we don't know what's going to happen that just forget that Donald Trump was elected president. I mean, I think that would be very hard if you're writing any kind of realist novel, you know, unless it's zebras on another planet. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I, th but, but I do think the great political novels, you think about someone like Dostoevsky, um, and I'm not uh, supporting, you know, all his views, but he used Russian nihilism 
uh, as an avenue into really profound philosophical questions um, in, in the possessed or the devils, for example. But there's always a certain time of, I don't know, of, yeah, yeah of, of letting these yeah. problems simmer. Sure, sure. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a very interesting challenge that I think more of us are feeling uh, yeah. today more than ever before. Uh, and as you know, Doris Lessing also yes. very beautifully, she said, literature is analysis after the event. So yeah. lots of things happen yeah. and then you need to let time to go by. We need to digest, understand, analyze, and then you can write about it. But there's a part of me that also thinks maybe we're, we have entered a new time period in history in which maybe literature also needs to become analysis during the event. And how do we do that? Maybe we have to find new forms. It's quite risky because we need that kind of cognitive distance. But there's also a new immediacy, new urgency, yes. at least yes. it makes sense because so much is happening so fast. But it's a challenge, I yeah. think, yeah, yeah, because we need that distance. Um, maybe one more question from here and then I'll, I'll come there, yeah? Yes, please. Hello, uh, thank you for being both so inspiring and talking about intellectualism and um, also what you were saying about emotions in politics yeah. and emotions playing a big part in politics. I wondered what you both thought about the fact that emotions play in when people are speaking um, about politics, particularly online, and oh, yeah. the yeah. phenomenon that there are a lot of very intelligent women who have backed away from or left online spaces because of the backlash that they receive and mm -hmm. uh, what what solutions do you hope that there might be for for women reclaiming some online space to, yeah. to s give mm -hmm. their views yeah oh god yes I, I i you know what we f discover is that misogyny is alive and well Mm -hmm. Right, and that maybe misogyny has increased yeah. because of the political environment. And then you have a technology that allows anonymity uh, to proliferate. Yeah. And uh, again, we can't blame the technology for the feelings of, of the people, right? That's important to make the distinction. But uh, it's it's terrible. I have I did a little research on this, and they are now having scholarly forums on what this misogyny means. You know, death threats, rape threats, uh, uh, threats to cut people up for, say, making a a, a pretty <laughs> simple feminist statement. What does this tell us? Yeah. Absolutely, and in addition to those, we have like government trolls organized in hundreds, thousands, the moment you, s you write anything critical. So that part of the internet is quite scary. It's very, very dark. It's very interesting though. There have been, every, almost every research shows this. When you inquire who are these people, yeah. most of them in their daily lives are, you know, they open doors to the next person. They can be <laughs> polite. They can, they, you know, they, they can look like, O all of us, but the moment we sit at our desk and we go into that space as if something is lifted and we think we can say anything and everything without bearing any responsibility, we forget that the people we're insulting are also human beings and this will affect them. So that to me is very interesting, the internet persona versus who we are in our daily lives. And it's a dilemma we need to of course deal with, but that said, and I know there are some American authors, colleagues who have spoken very negatively about social media and how writers right. completely pull out of social media. Uh, I think when you come from countries like Turkey, maybe you can't generalize it that way because I've seen, I've seen the dark side of social media, but also the bright side of it. And when I say this, it is a much more egalitarian space. It does connect people who wouldn't normally find yes, it that yes, easy. Yes 
to access information knowledge. For people in Turkey, Egypt, across the Middle East, it is a much more political platform, you know, Twitter, because if there's no freedom of speech, the social media does become more politicized. But perhaps more importantly, I think it gives women an additional space. So women who can't, because all across the Middle East, women are pushed back into the private space. But when I look at internet users, it's half and half. Many young women find an additional zone of existence there. And I think there is, there is value in that. So I can't generalize it as a completely negative experience. We need to try to make the best of it. Uh, but perhaps also keep in mind this distinction between information, knowledge, and wisdom. Because we have ev information about everything. We tend to think we have the knowledge, but they're completely different things. And wisdom is completely different altogether because it also requires emotional intelligence. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think there was one question over there, yeah. I've got a question for Siri principally. I've been very interested in what you've written um, about psychoanalysis. And I wondered what you felt psychoanalysis has to offer, um, you, you know, thinking currently about what's going on in the world and how it continues to shape your own thinking. Yeah. Well, you know, psychoanalysis, uh, it may be having a little bit of a resurgence. I, I, I belong to an organization called Neuropsychoanalysis, and uh, they're, you know, showing how any number of Freud's uh, ideas, especially Freud, but also uh, some later analysts like D.W. Winnicott, the British analyst, um, you know, that it seems to be borne out by contemporary neuroscience. But quite aside from that, I think that Freud's great gift to, con to, to modern culture, if you will, is the idea of two people in a space where the possibility of therapeutic healing through dialogue is what happens. Mm -hmm. So whether you're, you know, very few people lie on a, on a couch five days a week anymore, but there are many, many people in therapeutic situations. And I deeply believe, first of all, that we are not isolates, you know, that we are made in and through other people, especially intimate people. And that through dialogue, that particular kind of healing dialogue, we are able to become conscious of what we're not conscious of. Sure. And that that has a very important role, continues to have an important role. Uh, you know, one person at a time, uh, but nevertheless, people are changed by this. There's just no question about it. So, um, yes, I'm a fan of, of, of psychoanalysis and other forms of, of therapeutic interventions that truly seem mm -hmm. to make people better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe two more questions, shall we? Yeah. Sorry. Hi, thank you so much for today. It's been great. Um, I'm from the States, but I live here now but I've just been back visiting s my sisters. Yes. And they have been talking about a dilemma because of the Charlottesville stuff and because of really a, a wide range of um, gatherings of white supremacists in the States. A lot of people are agonizing about what do we do about it? Do we go and confront them knowing that that may um, yeah. create violence or respond to violence or allow people who are opposed to the white supremacists be violent but if we stay away then are we just saying it's all okay and there's a real big dilemma going on for people not just about being frightened um, but putting that aside just is it the right thing to do so I just wondered if you have any comments about that uh, I've been thinking a lot yeah. about the utter brilliance of the civil rights movement yeah. in the United States um, and the nonviolent approach. They were so organized yeah. that they didn't send anyone out to demonstrate who hadn't been trained 
in nonviolence. Mm -hmm. And you know, it is extremely difficult for any mammal <laughs> to not respond when they're hit or threatened. So that takes skill. And I've thought a lot about how if this resistance movement can really get off its feet, we need excellent organizers and start training people in nonviolence. Because uh, when people looked on television mm -hmm. during the civil rights movement and they saw those mm -hmm. police and racist demonstrators going after these people who just slumped yep. and dragging them into, that was a real plus for the cause. Yep. They knew exactly what they were doing and television changed things. Now we have social media. If the resistance movement, whatever it is, it's a very fragmented business, could adopt that Thoreauian, Tolstoyan, uh, a Gandhi position of nonviolence, I think it would do a, a, a lot of good. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't know what you think. No, I fully agree. D just in addition to that, however, I'm, I'm worried about the echo chambers that we have on the internet because if our sources of information come only from similar, similar places, there's a big chance that those images would not be seen by, by everyone and they yeah. would be seeing yeah. or hearing or reading a very filtered and distorted truth. Yeah. How do we deal with that? Because, of, because there's so much information, you know, this bombardment. I think that's going to be one of, one of our biggest challenges. People don't believe. Even when they see it on TV, they say it's the corrupt media. Yeah. It's this channel is, is biased. And we have been badly divided into mental ghettos, cultural, political ghettos. Uh, but we need to go beyond those. I think it, it falls on all of us to move beyond yeah. those echo chambers. There still are, there still is a flat earth society, you know. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> Just to leave everyone with <laughs> that well, remark. Sometimes there's nothing to be done. <laughs> <laughs> on that positive note. <laughs> It's been such a pleasure, oh, such a privilege too, for Elise, me, honestly. You. <laughs> You're wonderful. I've just been to see um, Siri Hustvet and Elif Shafak in conversation together in the main tent, and it was quite wonderful. They are two of my favorite writers and I couldn't <laughs> believe that they were both going to be there at the same time. So um, my friend actually noticed and booked and so I came down last night especially to see them today. Well, I have been before but this is my first event this year and I think the atmosphere is always so nice. It's uh, suddenly very different when you come in off the street from the crowds out in the festival generally, when you come into the book festival. The atmosphere is very special and very different and um, very civilized. <laughs> oh, it's amazing. The range is so wide. There's something for everybody. I mean, you don't have to be just a reader of fiction. Uh, if you're interested in sport, if you're interested in politics, if you're interested in adventure, I think there's something for everybody, if you have children too. Um, and of course the bookshop is incredibly tempting. And the children's bookshop, if you have grandchildren, is incredibly tempting. <laughs> it's very civilising, it's very thoughtful, it brings a lot of thoughtful people together, a lot of sensitivity, a lot of excitement, a lot of aw political awareness, everything together. I, I think it's culturally really, really valuable. Okay, I've just been to see um, Siri Hudsvet and uh, Elif Shafik and uh, I was inspired to go and see that particular uh, discussion because I like the idea of two um, female authors and talking about various ideas together um, and sort of a more structured kind of environment um, and I'd seen Elif last year as well um, so I really enjoyed that um, and I've always wanted to see Siri.
Um, I really love the fact that actually you can have um, different authors all coming together to do different things on the stage um, rather than just one single author. Um, I think it works, works really well. Um, I find it really enjoyable just to see them bouncing ideas off each other and um, it, yeah, it's just nice to be able to kind of go to something where you do have the option of seeing more than one author all together. It's great. Um, I have been to the book festival before, I've been here for a number of years actually in a row. Um, it's definitely the first thing that I look at when I'm uh, booking festival things, I have to admit I'm a bit of a book geek. Um, and I did used to do some rhyme times here when I worked for Edinburgh Libraries, so um, it was nice to see the other side as well of, of kind of doing things for people, but um, certainly now I just love coming and enjoying myself as well. The atmosphere here is always really very relaxed, I think, um, and very inclusive. Um, I used to come here um, just on my own or with friends. Um, I used to come in the evenings, and now that I'm a mother, I kind of bring my child with me as well. So, um, yeah, I tend to think it's kind of, yeah, quite a, a little haven, <laughs> a little oasis of calm, actually, but um, where exciting things can happen. <laughs> It's very vast, it takes a while to go through the, um, the brochure, so obviously there's something for everybody um, and I think um, the festival caters for um, lots of different interests and I, I notice that every year there's a different theme or actually lots of different themes so I think having them running alongside each other is always really interesting because there's always something that can kind of fit into a particular interest that people have and also then there's the whole range of family things as well. Um, the craft as well is always very good to complement it. <laughs>